Thanks, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, we'll be talking about men's health and the urologist and uh, the what's, the why's, and the how to's. So, when we think about men's health, uh, the public might come to thinking about Men's Health Magazine, and most importantly, Justin Bieber's Secrets to the Perfect Pecs. Got me interested. <laughs> Academically, um, the field is growing and expanding rapidly. Uh, there's health reports coming out in Europe and Asia right now. There's health policies in Australia and Ireland. And uh, it's still a young field though, and there's only three men's health chairs uh, in the world. England, Germany, and uh, in Ottawa. Uh, it's also a multidisciplinary field and involves a lot of different uh, health practitioners ranging from nurses to dietitians, cardiologists, epidemiologists, psychologists. And uh, we have a uh, unique opportunity in urology in that a uh, large portion of our practice is uh, uh, including men's health and uh, sensitive issues that we only have the opportunity in dealing with. Uh, so uh, we have a, a unique opportunity to be a leader in the field, similar to gynecology in women's health and move things forward. Men's health can be uh, a subgroup or a subspecialty within the field of urology, similar to that of urooncology or endourology. And in today's talk, hopefully we'll communicate that there's a little bit of men's health within all of the subspecialties uh, that's of relevance. So we'll first start by looking at the discrepancies in morbidity and mortality, uh, looking at the behavioral factors that are underlying these uh, things, and then masculinity is kind of underlying the behavioral factors. We'll then go into some of the discrepancies in urologic disease and finish up with a, a little bit of social science. I know her will be cringing, but uh, talking about behavioral change strategies, theoretical models, and a little bit of practical stuff for uh, everybody's everyday practice. So starting with the discrepancies, uh, there's a difference in, in uh, life expectancy between uh, men and women. This is found all over the world, all over Canada, and in particular in British Columbia, there's a four-year discrepancy with uh, men being having a life expectancy of 80 and women of 84. Uh, these are 2012 statistics. Uh, how much of that is driven by uh, deaths as youths uh, as opposed to later stage health? Exactly. It's a, it's a great point and, and this slide speaks to that uh, to a certain extent. Uh, there is a, a large majority of uh, deaths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the coffee that I bought him. <laughs> So, so uh, there's different metrics for measuring life expectancy. The HALE or the Health Adjusted Life Expectancy uh, looks at uh, measuring the number of years lived in perfect health. So once you get a disease, uh, your, your HALE score goes down. Men's is lower than women's, being 71 compared to 75. Uh, what this means is that men are, are acquiring their diseases earlier in life than women are. The second point, the potential years of life lost, addresses Dr. Gleave's question in that uh, the equation for this is life expectancy minus the, the age of death, and uh, this will give you the potential years of life lost. Uh, men almost have twice the number of potential years of life lost compared to women, meaning that men are dying at an earlier age or prematurely than women are. As opposed to health that we've been, you know, cardiovascular risk, cancer, all the other things we've had. You would ask and he would answer. <laughs> 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 That's perfect. You're validating me. <laughs> so, yeah, cardiovascular health is, is the main contributor to these potential years of life lost with early uh, premature deaths. Uh, other factors, non-automobile accidents, suicide, automobile accidents, and cancers are, are kind of the leading contributors to the discrepancy in premature death in males. For every uh, 10 women that die before the age of 50, 16 men will die. It's another statistic. Uh, Industrial trauma in Northern BC, that was the there was a Northern Health report that shows 
five percent of workplace deaths occur in the small parts of the economy in the north. So is it true that most of the discrepancy is due to uh, oil and gas from a risk uh, accident from? Yeah, there's, uh, this graph represents about 19%, well, including suicide, even more, 20, 28% um, due to these behavioral kind of problems. And then there's um, there's also some discrepancies even in, in the things that we're typically used to hearing about the cardiovascular disease, cancer. I'll get to a couple of those slides uh, later in the talk, <coughs> just showing the discrepancies. Uh, so with, with the cardiovascular disease, uh, men are 70% more likely to die of heart disease once they acquire it and 84% more likely to die of arterial disease. So looking at the graphs, uh, the one on the left is for cardiovascular disease. X-axis is uh, uh, the age in half decades, and uh, the black line shows the male to female ratio in mortality. And the right-sided axis is the number for the, that ratio. So if we look at the cardiovascular disease, uh, men are typically higher than women with a ratio of about 2.5, in the decades of the, the sixth and seventh compared to the women. Uh, for the cerebral vascular diseases, it's around the same age group, but the, the trend lines are more similar. Behavioral uh, problems and, and other factors related to cardiovascular disease include being overweight or obese. Uh, here from uh, Stats Canada, uh, men tend to be more overweight or more obese more frequently than women are, and particularly in British Columbia, with a ratio of about 3.9 people being overweight uh, in, in the men group compared to the women's group. Uh, addressing the question with the accidental health, uh, on the left side are the automobile accidents, and most of these are occurring in the, the 15 to 25 uh, age range, and uh, it reaches uh, a ratio of approximately three in these decades, and the non-automobile accidents is an even higher ratio of approximately five, again, in this earlier age group which would skew our average of uh, uh, mean life expectancy. Suicide is also a big contributor. Men are four times more likely to commit suicide, and this contributes to approximately 20 deaths per 100,000 uh, compared to five in women per 100,000 deaths. Talking about the uh, cancers that we're a little bit more uh, used to, men are 29% more likely to be diagnosed with a cancer and then once you get this cancer, you're 40% more likely to die of it. And in the graph shown here, it's a bimodal distribution. So there's a group of uh, men that are getting these cancers in the 15 to 20 age group, as well as the later stages of life in the 60s and 70s, uh, where it reaches uh, a ratio uh, just over uh, 1.5. Uh, in terms of diabetes, the ratio between the two is pretty similar. But once you have diabetes, men are approximately 40% more likely to die as uh, complications of the disease compared to women. Another behavioral thing uh, listed in the uh, list of potential years of life loss is uh, murders and homicides. And uh, across the entire age range, um, men are more likely to be killed by homicide than women are, particularly in the 20 to 30 age group. Substance abuse is also a problem, uh, with 50% uh, more men uh, likely to have uh, problematic drinking behaviors, and nearly 60% of men in Canada are smokers, and 25% of all deaths have been attributed to smoking as an underlying risk factor. <clears throat> so where does this uh, discrepancy come from? How can we explain this? Uh, we can use a biopsychosocial model for this, looking at biological factors, environmental factors, and behavioral factors. So in the biological factors, there's uh, hormonal differences, there's brain structural differences, and anatomic differences. We won't get into it too much, but if you can see the, the male brain is quite different than what you'd expect from a female brain. Being urologist, I'd like to bring your attention to the toilet aiming cell, which is largely greater than the domestic skills and the ironing, and more uh, useful for the residents is the listening particle. Environmental factors, uh, we tend to have riskier jobs, and 97% of the workplace place deaths are attributed to men uh, compared to women. Social support is also lower in men. We're uh, less likely to have intimate friends, 
Uh, when we have a time of stress, we're also less likely to have a confidant. And uh, there's been a study that showed that those men that have uh, low levels of social support are two to three times more likely to die of a chronic disease uh, than men that have a high level of social support. Finally, looking at behavioral factors, uh, high risk taking behaviors, uh, less health promoting behaviors, and then the underlying masculine role. Could there be some room for improvement? Possibly. If you're still not convinced, <laughs> the power bar in the pool is. Uh, <laughs> this is contributing to our statistics. That's taking place about the It's salt water. So these behaviors do contribute to mortality. On the x-axis, you can you can see that it's the percentages of years of life lost contributing by the behavioral factors on the left. Tobacco is in the lead, uh, followed by high blood pressure, um, alcohol use, high cholesterol, being overweight, poor diet, being a uh, sedentary lifestyle. So if we look a little bit more closely at health promoting behaviors, uh, we do a lot less of these. So these things include sleeping less, rushing recovery times, using seatbelts less, uh, taking fewer medications when we're supposed to take them, uh, using less sun protection, and uh, our diets tend to have more fat, more meat, and uh, more salt, less fiber, less fruits, and uh, those kinds of things. We also use the healthcare system uh, far less than our female counterparts. Uh, between the ages of 15 and 60 is the largest discrepancies, but the trend is there for the whole lifespan. Um, finally, uh, the risk-taking behaviors. We also do a lot more of these. We do more high-risk uh, leisure activities and sports. We tend to have more sexual partners. Uh, we're more violent behaviors. Uh, there's a statistic 50% of men within uh, the United States uh, report being hit at some point in their lifetime, uh, which is far exceeds that of women. Uh, we tend to drive drunk more frequently and also use substances more often. When we look at health beliefs specifically, uh, we tend to uh, be a little bit on the optimistic side. Uh, we tend to believe that our health is actually better than women believe their health is. And when we look at specific risk factors, uh, we tend to look at it with a maybe more positive lens. Uh, and we, we perceive less risk when we're looking at smoking and alcohol use, uh, getting skin cancer from sun exposure, uh, or getting uh, sexually transmitted infections, or just even general illness or injury in general. Uh, underlying this is thought to be the sociology construct of masculinity. I won't get into it too much, uh, but everybody has been familiar with the term. And here are just some quotes from one of the papers I was reading, uh, demonstrating exactly the masculine kind of roles. A macho doesn't show weakness. Grit your teeth. Take the pain. Bear it alone. Be tough. When you got stabbed, you usually band yourself up. To go to the doctor would appear that you're soft. For Royan healthcare is a means of rejecting girl stuff. So this is this is the root of uh, maybe some of these behavioral problems. And there's also <laughs> you agree. Should we eat some steak? I have a slide that shows this billboard that says, and then uh, more men will die this year of stubbornness. And somebody has written on the bottom of it in handwriting, no, we won't. <laughs> Uh, so, um, a couple individuals have looked at this um, construct of masculinity and how it correlates to some of these health beliefs and health behaviors. What they find is that higher levels of masculinity is correlated to all these risk-taking behaviors, the increased smoking, poor diet, sleeping less. Uh, they're also found to be depressed more often, uh, handle stress uh, more poorly, have more anxiety, use the healthcare system less, and be more resistant to these behavioral changes. So putting it all together, this underlying masculinity seems to be contributing to these behavioral factors, which is, seems to be contributing uh, to the uh, increased mortality, especially at an earlier age in life. So I'll bring Sean up for the next section of the talk here. So, um, Ryan talked about some of the discrepancies between men and women in terms of life expectancy and quality of life, as well as the need for a men's health discipline. 
And uh, there is growing acknowledgement among urologists that we do need to step up to the plate in regards to men's health. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why as urologists we're well positioned to be leaders in men's health and why as urologists we should care about men's health. So obviously we do see a lot of male uh, specific or male predominant diseases. So obviously diseases of the prostate, the testes, the penis, these are all male specific diseases. Uh, as well though, many of the other diseases that we do treat are predominantly, um, they affect men. So this is uh, two figures from um, the Canadian Cancer Society. On the left is the most common cancers in Canada. On the right is the most common causes of cancer death in Canada. And I've just outlined bladder cancer and kidney cancer. Uh, you can see there's a discrepancy between men and women. So bladder cancer is the fourth most common cancer among men in Canada. It's three times more common in men than women. And one in 28 men will develop bladder cancer versus one in 78 women. It's also the sixth leading cause of death from cancer among men in Canada. And if you look at the age standardized mortality rate in men, it's over three times higher than a woman. A uh, similar sort of picture, not to the same extent though, in renal cell carcinoma. It is the sixth most common cancer among men in Canada, one and a half times more common in men than women. It's also the eleventh leading cause of death from cancer among men and the age standardized mortality rate in men is two times higher than in women. And uh, finally, kidney stones. Uh, kidney stones affect 5% of the population, uh, but they are twice as common in men as in women. Uh, another important uh, point is that the peak age that they affect men is at age 30. And so this is something we'll touch back on later, but um, men coming in with a kidney stone at age 30, they might not have seen a doctor five or 10 years uh, previous to that, and they might not see a doctor for another five or ten years. Uh, so as a urologist treating these men, uh, we're sort of in a unique opportunity to offer some behavioral uh, recommendations and help uh, shape some of their risk factors for the future. So why are urologic diseases important to the bigger picture of men's health, and how do they impact future morbidity? So one way is that many of our diseases can serve as risk markers for cardiovascular disease or other comorbidities. Um, first example I'll go over is erectile dysfunction. This was pointed out uh, in a paper in JAMA by Thompson uh, that came out in 2005. This was looking at the placebo group from the PCPT trial. Um, I think we're all familiar with the trial, but uh, these men were followed every three months uh, and asked about the erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. Um, and Thompson found that incident erectile dysfunction was associated with an increased risk of incident cardiovascular disease by about 50%, and when they adjusted for some confounders, by about 25%. And this is a similar unadjusted risk as current smoking and family history of myocardial infarction. Um, there's also a more recent study that came out last year in FOSS Medicine. Uh, this reported on a large prospective cohort trial. Um, out of Australia called the 45 and up study. Um, they reported that severe erectile dysfunction was associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, again by about 50%, and when they adjusted for a different set of confounders, uh, by about 35%. Um, interestingly, they also found that severe erectile dysfunction was associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality um, with an adjusted hazard ratio of about 2 um, also, kidney stones has been shown to be a risk marker of coronary heart disease. Uh, this was a study that came out in JAMA last year using the Health <coughs> Professionals follow-up study from the United States. Uh, there was about 45,000 men with a follow-up period of about 24 years. Uh, they reported an age-adjusted hazard ratio of about 1.18 for coronary heart disease. So men with kidney stones had about a 20% higher risk of coronary heart disease compared to men of similar age. Uh, when they adjusted for some confounders, this went down to about 10%, and when they adjusted for even more confounders, it went down to 6%. Uh, but the important point here is not looking at any sort of causal pathway between kidney stones and coronary heart disease, but looking at it as a, as a marker. Uh, Marshall, uh, Marshall Stoller at UCSF has published on uh, positive relationship, but maybe stones may have the vascular physiology. 
Um, and so, as urologists, we can also make a difference because many of our diseases share many common underlying risk factors uh, with cardiovascular disease or other comorbidities. So if you look at smoking, poor diet, lack of exercise, obesity, use of illicit drugs, occupational risk factors, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, these are all risk factors for many urologic diseases as well as cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this is just a brief chart showing on the left some common urologic diseases. Um, and the point of this slide is just to have an understanding that many of the risk factors for the diseases we treat are very similar to diseases um, uh, to cardiovascular disease and other comorbidities. So as urologists, we should be aware of these risk factors and it's a good idea to talk to your patients uh, about them and make some recommendations for improving them. Uh, so one guideline that I think is have good to have a look at uh, if you have some time is the AUA Men's Health Checklist. Uh, this outlines for men in different age groups uh, what the recommended urology and general health checks should be uh, that should be done. Um, no one is saying for every patient you have to sit down for an hour and go through every one of these, um, but it's good to have an idea of what should be done and what needs to be done. So if you see any anything glaring when you see a patient, you can talk to them about it, recommend they follow up with a family doctor about it. Um, so I'm going to go over three different diseases now that we see commonly and that some behavioral changes can make a difference both for future long-term health and for treatment of the actual disease. Uh, so this was uh, for erectile dysfunction. This is a randomized control trial that came out uh, in JAMA about 10 years ago. They randomized 110 men who were middle-aged with erectile dysfunction. Uh, they randomized them to two different interventions. The control group got general information on how to eat healthy, how to exercise, a couple of pamphlets and brochures, and they were sent on their way. The intervention group got detailed uh, patient-specific advice on how to lose 10% or more of their body weight with help from uh, dietitians and uh, physical trainers. And they found that after two years, that intervention not only lowered their BMI, increased the amount of physical activity, which is what you'd expect, but also improved their erectile dysfunction. Um, there's also the Princeton 3 guidelines for erectile dysfunction. I don't know if anyone's heard of these or familiar with them, but this is a consensus recommendations on uh, what management and screening tests should be done in men when they present with erectile dysfunction. And they recommend screening for high blood pressure, glucose, lipids, testosterone, and creatinine. And this makes sense uh, based on what we've talked about earlier, that 50% uh, men with erectile dysfunction have a 50% higher risk for cardiovascular disease compared to men of similar age. Um, so the message here is not that as urologists we need to be monitoring and screening for blood pressure and managing it with different antihypertensives, but that we should be aware that men with erectile dysfunction should have these screening tests so we can recommend them to our patients, we can give them some brochures, and uh, we can included in uh, the letter to the family doctor. So another uh, perfect case study would be uh, kidney stones. Many of the risk factors we see in kidney stone disease are similar uh, to cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this is, this is a good study. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is a public figure uh, from Toronto. Um, but if you just look at his public life, you can see that he does have a lot of health issues. Uh, and in addition to being hospitalized twice for <coughs> kidney stones, he also has issues with lack of exercise, alcohol, obesity, poor diet, illicit drug use. Okay, so these are all, uh, not every patient with kidney stone is going to look like this, but these are all opportunities we can have to talk to our patients about some of the risk factors they have. So a possible action plan. Uh, you can talk to them about some dietary advice, how to eat healthier, increase their fluids, exercise more, screen for blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, which makes sense again, we know with men with kidney stones have a 20% higher risk for coronary heart disease. Okay, And again, not that we have to manage all this on ourselves, but there are referrals that are possible, dietitian, nephrologist that can help manage with some of these. Uh, just to give you an idea of how behavioral change can make a difference, this was a randomized control trial from New England Journal of Medicine about 12 years ago. It's a two-year study involving 120 men with recurrent calcium oxalate stones and, and hypercalciuria. Uh, they randomized them to two groups, either a diet with low calcium or a diet with a normal amount of calcium, but reduced animal protein and reduced salt. 
They found that after five years, the risk of having a recurrence of stones was 50% lower in the intervention group. They also found that the intervention diet lowered urinary calcium as well as urinary oxalate. Finally, I'll talk about bladder cancer. Um, so if someone comes in with gross hematuria, you decide to do a cystoscopy, and uh, you find this. Uh, in addition to the management plan, you should also be thinking about some of the risk factors that might have contributed to this, such as smoking, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and occupational risk factors. Um, these are all options that you can talk to your patients about. Of course, if you're going to talk to them about one, uh, the best one is obviously smoking. And this is because we know that 50% of bladder cancer cases are attributed to smoking. There was a study that came out in JAMA three years ago uh, that estimated that current smokers have a fourfold higher risk of bladder cancer and former smokers have a twofold higher risk. And that's compared to never smokers. Um, we also know that about a quarter of patients who are are current smokers at the time of diagnosis of their bladder cancer, and at least 75% of these patients are male. And uh, Ryan talked about smoking as the number one cause of potential years of life lost, and there is a huge discrepancy between men and women. So this is just the chart showing the prevalence of smoking in females. This is from 2009. You don't have to pay attention to the numbers, but the darker the color, the more prevalent smoking is. Uh, so this is for females, and this is for males. Okay, as well, if you look at the top 10 causes of death in men in the United States, um, the ones in bold, obviously heart disease and cancer, are attributable to uh, smoking. But uh, there's actually, interestingly, evidence in meta-analyses that smoking has been associated with all 10 of these diseases. And the reason we're emphasizing talking about uh, smoking cessation with bladder cancer patients is because right now it doesn't seem like we're doing enough. So this is a study from six years ago where they surveyed 600 urologists um, in the AUA. They found that only 20% of them um, always discussed smoking cessation with bladder cancer patients, and over half of them reported that they never did. And a uh, study from the UK found that only 7% of current smokers diagnosed with bladder cancer um, were advised to quit by their urologist. And the reason it's important as urologists to talk to our patients is because we can actually make a difference. Uh, this is a study out of California. They found that smokers newly diagnosed with bladder cancer were five times as likely to quit compared to the general population of smokers. And the top two reasons cited for quitting was the advice of the urologist and the bladder cancer diagnosis. Uh, smoking cessation in these patients is also going to be beneficial in terms of the management of their disease. So there's a meta-analysis of six randomized controlled trials showing that preoperative smoking cessation can reduce the risk of postoperative complications by about 41%. Uh, we also know that smoking cessation at diagnosis can improve disease-specific outcomes such as tumor recurrence, tumor progression, and cancer-specific mortality. And recently, there's a population-based cohort study from China that found that patients who continued smoking after bladder cancer diagnosis had a threefold higher risk of death compared to those that quit after. So it's never too late to talk to patients, um, even though many of us would probably consider bladder cancer a disease of the elderly, which is true. Over 70% of patients with bladder cancer over the age of 65, the median age of diagnosis is 72 years in men. Um, but we do know from large prospective cohort studies that smoking cessation in one's 60s, 70s, or 80s can also reduce the risk of smoking-related mortality by over 20%. Um, as well, this doesn't take an hour-long intervention with your patients to talk about smoking cessation. Um, we do know from, uh, there's a study by Bierlin who randomized 180 uh, urology clinic patients to a brief smoking cessation intervention. They found that uh, the intervention more than doubled the odds of patients attempting to quit. We also know from a recent Cochrane review that brief smoking cessation advice can increase the rate of quitting by 66%. Um, so there's two different ways you can talk to patients. Uh, the NIH has the five A's, some of you might be familiar with, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. A uh, simpler approach is the award approach. Uh, so you ask your patients if they smoke. You warn your patients by saying, if you continue to smoke, your chance of dying from smoking-induced disease is 50%. You advise them that if they quit now, their risk will be greatly reduced by 25% at old age and much more before the age of 40. 
You can refer them to a smoking cessation clinic or hotline. There is a smoking cessation clinic at Vancouver General Hospital. Uh, there are brochures you can give them. You can make a mention to their family doctor about it. And then you do it again until they quit. And uh, they say if you've helped two smokers quit, you've saved at least one life. Uh, so now Brian's going to talk about some other approaches to behavioral change uh, in urology patients. Thanks, John. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, behavioral models uh, to elicit change, and uh, these are just a few of the ones uh, more frequent in the literature, and we won't really get into a lot of this, but just so that we're aware that there's, there are a lot of different models. Uh, in the field of men's health, uh, we tend to use more of an ecological approach, and we do this because it's more generalized, and it can account for uh, multiple different levels of intervention to help facilitate a behavioral change. So at the public policy level, uh, some examples of this have been um, seatbelt use, and uh, uh, we find now that less people are dying from uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents uh, related to uh, non-compliance with their seatbelts, uh, smoking cessation, uh, and all the smoking policies uh, publicly uh, from 1960s, where over 40% of people smoked, uh, compared to recent years where only 22% of people smoke in North America, uh, these things have been making a difference. As we kind of work our way down uh, to the individual and uh, interpersonal level, this is where it's more relevant to the everyday urologist. Um, and just to uh, give an example, in addition to those that Sean provided, um, uh, in this systematic review, they looked at 18 studies with uh, behavioral interventions of different varieties. And uh, in this particular one, they were looking at increasing physical activity, and it was successful. Uh, they had uh, increased median time spent doing the activity of about 35%, and increased energy expenditure of about 64% across all of these different behavioral intervention programs. So when we bring it back to, to the urologist, what's a quick, easy, simple uh, recipe that we can follow? The first thing I'd like to just point out is uh, just identifying the behavior and commenting to the patient uh, brings us farther ahead. As Sean's statistics were showing that you know, maybe only 7 to 20 percent of patients are actually hearing the message of making behavioral change in something uh, is smoking and, and bladder cancer. Um, and if you can do this and relay it back to the family physician, there'll be kind of two heads uh, on the project already. We also have a lot of opportunity to do this. We see people from uh, pediatrics all the way up until end of stage, uh, end of stage and end of life um, comorbidities and problems in neurology. So there's always a lot of opportunity to talk to individuals about these behavioral problems, make interventions and make a difference for the rest of their life. So let's do a, a quick recipe here. So first it's important to identify the problem or the behavior and communicate that behavior that you want changed to the patient. So McDreamy here would say, I'd like to see you more physically active. Next, ask the patient if they've been thinking about making a behavioral change and get a sense as to whether they've it's been on the radar at all or if if they say, hey, you know, I have been looking into these smoking cessation clinics or I have been getting a bike to do some exercising. So you know kind of where they're coming from so you can tailor your personal message a little bit more relevantly and they'll hear it better. And there's also evidence that uh, they're more successful in eliciting a behavioral change if you match your recommendation to their readiness of change. So you can say, have you thought about being more physically active? This brings us to uh, the trans theoretical model, briefly get into it, uh, where it just uh, identifies the process of changing your behavior goes through multiple different stages. So this relates back to the last question. Uh, if you identify somebody in pre-contemplation, it means they're not even thinking about making a change in their behavior. Uh, you move to the next stage, contemplation. They've been thinking about it, but they still aren't convinced that they're gonna have to make the, the behavioral change and do an intervention. Once you get to the preparation phase, they've made the decision to do the behavioral change, but they haven't gone to the action phase yet, and they're probably going to start it within the next month. Once you get to action, they're doing it, then you have to maintain it and prevent relapse. Uh, looking at the health behavior model, uh, I just want to identify four key points that they've identified as being important in getting your patients to comply and to, to do these behavioral changes. So the first is perceived susceptibility and severity. So the patients need to understand that they are at risk for this and uh, they have to know about the consequences. 
So you could say, do you know the risks and potential consequences of being sedentary? The next is perceived benefits to performing the behavioral change. Uh, they need to know that there are benefits and, and uh, they will be better off in doing this. Uh, these two key points are more relevant to the early stages of change. So if they're still contemplating if they're going to do it or not, these key factors in addressing these two points uh, will, will help you be more successful in eliciting the change. The third one is asking about perceived barriers. Because um, it's important to know if, if uh, they have uh, maybe a simple question as to, uh, you know, who do I talk to about learning how to exercise more? Uh, that's a quick question and a quick answer that might uh, uh, take down one of these barriers to help them make the change. And the final one is perceived self-efficacy. So how confident do you feel uh, to start exercising and how can I help with this? Uh, sometimes this is easy as referring back to the family physician, giving them some resources. I have some here from Dr. Goldenberg in the Men's Health Clinic uh, that you're welcome to look at after. Um, but here is kind of more of a knowledge thing and enabling the person to be able to do this. So in conclusion, uh, men's health has a lot of unique challenges. There's mortality, um, difference and discrepancy between men and women, particularly at younger ages, and behavioral uh, factors are underlying a lot of these, meaning that we have a great opportunity to make a change and uh, make a change to these people's uh, future lives and health. Um, finally, um, uh, we don't have to do it alone. We can uh, use the resources uh, that we have available to us and also include the family physicians in uh, eliciting these changes. So here are some resources if you want to come talk to us after. And just like to thank Dr. Goldenberg. Thanks.